So this video is going to be looking at the sources to do with, mili with Augustus's military achievements, including the Res Gestae, uh, four different coins, and also Suetonius Augustus. So you need to find in your source books Augustus's military achievements section. So when we're looking at the sources to do with um, any of the emperors, but particularly Augustus, on their military achievements, we need to keep in mind the image that Augustus and the other emperors are trying to put forward, which is generally that they are a very successful military commander, that they are just, and that they bring great victories and empire expansion to the Roman Empire. We also need to keep in mind that obviously for Augustus, in reality, his military policy was quite... Not reluctant to go and attack places but quite careful he wasn't going to follow people like caesar who had sort of gone left right and center attacking very different places um on the edges of the empire augustus is far more measured more careful he's trying to sort of create this peace and maintain control in rome itself so yes there are some military successes but actually in terms of his policy it is quite gentle and quite gradual compared to even later emperors so we've got to keep all of that in mind especially when we're looking at res gestae obviously it's augustus's version of what he's trying to put forward about his military uh, prowess and achievements so we'll start with the res gestae 13 so he talks about this particular temple. So it says, our ancestors wanted Janus Curionus to be closed. So the Janus Curionus temple um, had these gates on them. I believe they're quite small gates, but I haven't obviously seen the temple myself. And what these gates were symbolic of whether or not the Roman state was at peace or at war. So if the gates were open, then Rome was at war. If the gates were closed, then they were at peace. Romans like their symbols. So he says that, you know, our ancestors wanted these gates to be closed when throughout all of the rule of the Roman Empire and see peace had been secured by victory, like I just said. So before my birth, it had been closed twice in all recorded memory from the founding of the city. So we're talking, you know, hundreds of years. The Senate voted three times in my principate that it be closed. So three times when Augustus was essentially the emperor, they managed to close the gates uh, of, of Janus. So this is showing obviously that Augustus is creating peace within the empire, which is something that the Romans, although they wanted to conquer places, they were also obsessed with this Roman peace idea. So he's been very successful because he's able to bring peace. And this is a policy sort of he's going to push forward through the source. So I restored peace to the sea from pirates, so very successful. In that slave war, I hand over the masters for the affliction of punishments, about 30,000 captured. You can highlight bits on this if you want to. You had fled their masters and taken arms against the state. Okay. All Italy swore allegiance to me voluntarily and demanded me as the leader of the war, which I won at Actium. So again, remember, he's never going to mention Mark Antony by name when it comes to the Res Gesta and the Battle of Actium. So he's just pointing out that at this particular war, all of Italy swore allegiance to me um, in a voluntary manner. Not every Italian did, of course they didn't. But this is the image he's trying to put forward, that he's very popular, that he's successful, and that everybody supports him. And then he also points out that the provinces of Gaul, Spain, Africa, Sicily, and Sardinia swore the same allegiance. So, like, everybody was supporting Octavian at the Battle of Actium, when in reality we know it was not quite as overwhelming as that. Um, he points out that those who fought under his standard, so that's at the Battle of Actium, more than 700 senators, 83 were made consuls later, um, and 770, sorry, were made priests. So he's popular, everyone thinks he's great, he's a great military leader. What you can do at this particular point here is link to the coin N31 with the capture of Egypt, because obviously that's the Battle of Actium as well. So that particular coin comes up in a couple of different sections, which can be used in different sections. Talking of coins, we have N5. Um, which is a direct reference to Actium. So if we look at the key things, he's got victory. Sorry, give me a second. Here. Oh, here, sorry. Um, standing. No, I was right here. Oh, sorry. On the prow of a ship. Uh, victory symbols and the palm. And obviously this is showing that he's won this great military victory. It's obviously been published a few years after the Battle of Actium. So this is obviously reinforcing the idea that he's a great military leader. And it's commemorating this triple triumph, the ones he was given after Actium and his other military successes, which was essentially put in a lot of rebels. The key thing is it's propaganda. Octavian is successful. He's a great commander. Like he's got you know, triumph. Isn't he brilliant? So then we move on to Suetonius. So Augustus commanded armies only in two foreign wars, and he tells you who, he's against the Dalmatians, not the dogs, um, while he was young, and then the Cantabrians after defeating Antony. So 
obviously Suetonius is pointing out that Augustus is not necessarily the most military prowess or kind of guy because Augustus wasn't he was pretty rubbish in the army as the story continues so one of the Dalmatian battles his right knee was bruised by a sling stone I'm sure it was really badly bruised and was really awful it makes it sound like he just knocked his knee I think it was a bit worse than that in another he had one arm and one leg sorry and both arms severely crushed when a bridge collapsed August has not got the best luck when it comes in the battles. He's not a particularly good, good fighter. So this is what Suetonius is pointing out, that, you know, he's not he's not great. And the remainder of his foreign wars were conducted by his lieutenants. So Augustus knew that he was not necessarily the best military leader himself. But what he was very good at doing was promoting the right people and sending out good lieutenants to fight on his behalf. And because Augustus technically, well, he did control the army through being imperator, any military uh, successes that came from his lieutenants would pass on to him. This is why he's able to show that he's his great military leader. But you could say this is him being sensible, sending out lieutenants. Um, so he sends out the lieutenants through some of the Pannonian and German campaigns. He either visited the front or kept close in touch by moving up the Ravenna, the Medellonium or the Aquilia. So he always visits if he can. Either as commander on the spot or commander in chief, Augustus conquered Cantabria, Antiquiana, I think, uh, Pannonia, Dalmatia, and the whole of Illyricum. So he, here's a list of things that he has conquered. We should be aware that some of these places were rebelling, and he basically just squashes the rebellions, but obviously he gets the sort of the glory of winning them. Um, the rest of this little bit of source just talks about different tribes, which I've not highlighted because it gets a little bit overwhelming. But obviously, do look through. You can get some specific people if you want to, but it's not that important. Um, Augustus never wantonly invaded any country and felt no temptation to increase the boundaries of the empire or enhance his military glory. I don't think Suetonius is being entirely accurate here. In terms of did Augustus just randomly attack places? No, that bit is true. He did not do that because he realised if you expand the empire too quickly, the, the Rome can't cope. Um, whether or not he felt no temptation to increase the boundaries of the empire... I think he probably was tempted, but realised he probably couldn't do it in order to create stability. Or enhance his military glory. Well, we've just looked at some coins that are quite blatantly putting forward his military glory. So you can sort of use these sources to show different arguments, depending. Um, and then he talks a few different examples about him not fighting people. So he made certain barbarian chiefs swear in the Temple of Engine Mars that would faithfully keep the peace for which they sued. So there's lots of like um, agreements coming up, and as you can see, I've not highlighted all of them. It's a bit much. Um, so sometimes he would kind of demand a hostage, mainly women, um, but he let the hostages go home, <laughs> which is fine. Um, and then if they sort of the tribes keep rebelling. The most he would do is sell the slaves and he would not allow them to go home for 30 years. Okay. However, we've got some good examples at the end, which I have highlighted. So his reputation for courage and clemency was that the very Indians and Scythians, who were really fierce fighters, the Scythians in particular, voluntarily sent envoys to Rome pleading for his friendship and that of his people. So Augustus really, really did favour signing agreements with different places instead of fighting them. That would always seem to be anyway his first sort of attempt at peace is to so sort of try and sign an agreement instead of having to go and fight them so another example we've got here is the parthians were also ready to grant augustus's claims on armenia and when he demanded the surrender of the eagles captured from crassus and antony not only returned them offered hostages into the bargain so he manages quite successfully to gain peace with parthia which had been a real kind of thorn in Rome's side. Now, when we look at a source later on, when Augustus talks about this, he talks about it slightly differently. But essentially, the Parthians were ready for peace. Augustus wants peace. It's all to do with Armenia, which again is portrayed in a coin a bit later. He is able to get the eagles back, the standards, which made Augustus look like a fantastic military leader because he reclaimed the sort of lost glory. Then we're back to the gates. We've got the gates of Janus Curinus. have been closed more than twice since the foundation of Rome. He closed three times, as Res Gestai points out. He enjoyed a triumphal ovation after Philippi, Philippi, sorry, and again after his Sicilian successes, and celebrated three full triumphs on three successive days for his victories won in Dalmatia, uh, off Actium, and at Alexandria. So this is basically him when he was consolidating his power early on. He gets three triumphs for it. Great military leader, easily wonderful. He suffered only two heavy and disgraceful defeats, both in Germany. That's not news for the Romans, to be honest. They were often defeated 
face defeats in Germany. Um, the most famous one of them is Varus. Um, so Varus nearly wrecked the empire because three legions, their general officers and auxiliary forces and the general staff were massacred. It was They were sort of trapped in this forest and they were quite literally slaughtered. Um, and obviously August was so worried that when news reached Rome, he ordered patrols of the city at night to prevent any rising. So he was worried that obviously the Roman people would kick off at hearing um, what happened. And sorry, he carries on trying to create peace. So he prolongs the terms of the provincial governors. So everyone's got experience in the right places. Um, he celebrates in games when things start to improve. And he took it really badly and didn't sort of trim his beard, which is a sign of mourning and grief in Roman society. So obviously Varus, the Varus disaster, and it is known as the Varus disaster, really hit Augustus quite hard. And it was very humiliating. However, Augustus didn't take the blame for it. It was Varus's own doing. He was a bit of an idiot. Um and was sort of trapped in this forest and was slaughtered. So as mentioned, um, Armenia, the way it's portrayed in the coins is that Armenia is captured. Now if we go back to, where is it? Do, 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 do. Armenia. Sorry, I didn't mean to sing into the microphone, a bit weird. Sorry, I've lost it now. Oh, here we go. That we have the Parthians are ready to accept Armenia and what Augustus wanted. So it's not a military victory in the slightest. However, on the coins, because it is propaganda, it is shown as Armenia captured isn't Augustus a fantastic ruler, but we know the truth behind it. Then we're back to the res gestae again. So I extended the borders of all provinces of the Roman people, which neighbor nations were not subject to a rule. Not entirely true. He quelled rebellions and he reinstated some boundaries, but he didn't really extend the boundaries. So again, it's one of these examples of the rest guest side where he's not telling the entire truth, but a version of the truth. Restore peace to the provinces of Gaul and Spain and Germany. Yeah, okay, partly true again. Uh, restore peace to the Alps um, with no unjust war against any nation. So whatever he did fight, it was because it was the right thing to do. Um, he sailed the ships where no Roman had gone before that time, land or sea. So he's sort of extending outwards beyond anybody ever had done. And lots of different people also, uh, sent envoys of friendship to me and the Roman people, which is obviously supported by what Suetonius has said. There's other ones he mentions. So he sends some armies into Ethiopia and Arabia, a place called Happy, which sounds nice. And these enemies were killed, towns were captured. So he's obviously trying to promote this idea that he's a great military commander. You know, he's sending the empire, he's bringing, but he's also bringing peace. But nothing he ever does is unjust. He's just an all-round fantastic military leader. Um, and then he adds Egypt to the ruled Roman people, obviously after Actium. And then there's this issue to do with Armenia. It's quite complicated, but essentially the Romans um, put in like a puppet king. And it became a client kingdom. So the puppet king ruled on behalf of Rome in the in the area, but was allowed to be left alone. So the king of Armenia was killed. So instead of making it a province, he instead handed it over to um, Tigrines, who was the son of this guy here, and a grandson of another Tigrines, who had been in Rome, this guy, uh, under Pompey and the Republic. Fun fact for you there. And so he's using, again, his diplomacy to try and sort of keep the peace. He doesn't want to make it a province. It's probably too difficult to do so. And again, the same nation after revolting, rebelling. Um, he subdued it through his son, Gaius. He's one of his, was his grandson, but his adopted son. And then he hands it over to a different king um, to keep the peace. And then he sent Tigrines um, into that rule um, after this guy was killed. So every time a leader of Armenia is killed, they replace him with another puppet king. And he points out, I recovered all the provinces which lie east across the Adriatic. Great. So again, it's kind of fitting into this idea that he is a great military leader. He also recovers uh, from Spain, Gaul and Dalmatia, many military standards lost through other leaders. So military standards are all these kind of eagles that... Um, are lost in various commands, so he gets them back. Hurrah! Now, here's Augustus's version of what happened with Parthia. I compelled the Parthians to return to the spoils and standards of the three Roman armies. Compelled is one way of phrasing it. Essentially, they made a peace treaty. 
that's actually what happens. But obviously Augustus is going to portray this in a particular way. So he compels the Parthians to do it. In reality, as Suetonius pointed out, the Parthians were more than ready to sign this agreement and wanted peace as well. So keep in mind of the Res Gestae, this is a classic example of him not telling the entire truth again. Uh, so you've got the tribes of the Pannonians. Um, they're conquered through Tiberius Nero, his stepson. And he subjects them to the rule of their own people, extends the bound border sorry, of Ill Illyricum out to the river Danube, which is in Germany, I think. So again, conquering places, he's doing a fantastic job. We have um, emissaries, so sort of envoys from Indian kings sent to me, um, which had never been seen before at any time of that Roman leader. So these guys heard about Augustus and how amazing a commander he was, so they make peace instead of fighting. And there's loads of examples within that section of the source you can pick out if you want to. We then have supplications by kings. So these are kings sending kind of envoys and sort of peace offerings. So we've got the Parthians mentioned yet again. And then we've got loads of these. So we've got the Tiridates. Uh, we've got the Medes. This guy here. This guy here. The Britons. The, wow, Dumnobelanus. And the Tinnacomius. Tin sorry. And the Sugarambri, the Me you do not need to know all these different people. You notice I've just picked out Parthians because they're the most important. And again, none are defeated in war, but seeking friendship by sort of promising um, children as, as hostages, as it were. And again, there's a whole list down here of other people um, seeking peace with Rome. Isn't he fantastic? Then we've got a couple more coins. So we have the public vows for Augustus' safety. So when Augustus went away, people were quite worried because obviously he was holding all the power and created a bit of a power vacuum. And also uh, Augustus came to symbolise Rome in it, like in person, I guess. So if Augustus was safe, then Rome was safe. And that's why there's these public vows for his safety. The important thing for us here, really, is this particular part of the inscription. It says, because through him, the state is in a more expansive and peaceful condition. So Augustus has expanded the empire, which is true, but not as much as being made out. And it is peaceful, which is probably more realistic. So it's just pointing out that, again, it's reinforcing Augustus's viewpoint that he's a great military leader. He brings peace, but he expands the empire at the same time rattling through these coins then we have n15 so he's receiving triumphal arches branches sorry so remember he sends out these commanders um because he is imperator because he's imperator he gets the glory and that's what these triumphal branches are they've been handed to him um, as part of his military success so if we look at the dates it's around 1215 where are we? So we've got Tiberius and another one of his um, stepsons, Drusus. It talks about it's about this place here. The place is not particularly important. The key thing is, is that, in fact, I will highlight it because I forgot to do it. Ooh, different colour. There we go. Is this bit. You can't quote this, but this is the key message here. That Augustus is seen as the supreme command of the troops, which is what I was explaining before I highlighted it. Okay. And that is it for the sources to do with his military commands. So the general rule is he created peace, he expanded the army, but not as much as he makes out in his own source. Everybody wanted to make peace with Rome because Augustus was such an awesome military leader. And that is why he fits into the grand scheme of military leaders in Rome. <laughs>